In this uh, very busy and exciting couple of weeks here at the Mahon, uh, today has stood out for me personally. Uh, I had, I've had the opportunity today, the very unique, really once in a lifetime opportunity to have introduced Blue Greenberg at a talk earlier today and introduce Yitz Greenberg tonight. Um, for me, growing up uh, as a modern Orthodox Jew, um, these are two of the great role models of the last, uh, really of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st in terms of um, not just for the substance of the profound Jewish theology which Yitz Greenberg has spent his career writing, teaching, and talking about and which he's going to share with you tonight, but also for a profound menschlichkeit which uh, deeply informs the public presence, persona, and public leadership that both Yitz and Blue represent. So it's a great personal honor and on behalf of the Machon uh, to introduce Yitz Greenberg tonight. I'll, I'll tell you what's on the bio. It's nothing that I think is unknown. Uh, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg is an influential theologian who has written extensively on post-Shoah theology, on the relationship of Judaism and Christianity, and on the ethics of power and religious cultural issues of pluralism after the Holocaust. He served as chairman of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council from 2000 to 2002, and he is currently writing a book, which I know is a labor of love, on the development of the covenant in the course of Jewish history. Wisdom is to get out of the way. Rabbi Yitz Greenberg. Thank you very much, Yehuda. It's a privilege to be at and speak at the Hartman Institute, a program and institution that I'm very really a great admirer and watched for many years. And it's a special privilege to have the opportunity to be here to speak to a group of a uh, hundred plus, whatever, fellow rabbis. Uh, my topic, as you know, is on being a rabbi in a post-rabbinic age. And that's not a bad description of how I feel I've spent my life, sort of pretty much trying to be a rabbi. I mean, I've been many things, and I've been called many things, but, I've, <laughs> but I, I have, in some ways, I feel that's what I ended up being, trying to be a rabbi in a post-rabbinic age. So let me get to the topic directly, and we will I hope there'll be time for your responses, too. This is a thesis I'm offering tonight. It's an outgrowth of a book that I'm working on, as you heard. Uh, the book is now four years and going, so I'm hoping I'll, I'll finish it before it finishes me. It's going to be a close race, obviously. Um, but I would, be, I would welcome responses and your, and your understanding, too. You talk about rabbis. You get a set of standard complaints from most rabbis, and I don't think these are complaints without justification. The overall complaint is the decline of the synagogue, particularly in America and diaspora. Current surveys show less than 50% or 45% of Jews belong to a synagogue at any one time in the United States of America. It's the declines of rabbi status and the profession as once the unquestioned peerless leaders of the community, now in many cases treated as less than that. It's a sense of being part of an army or of a world or of a community that's in retreat. Assimilation, very powerful. Worldwide secularization trends. And frankly, in talking about secularization trends, poll after poll has shown that American Jews particularly are the most secularized community in America. How often, people that go off into synagogue, to church or synagogue, uh, the general population, meaning Christian basically, rates are in the 60s and 70 percent. The American Jews who go to synagogue regularly, 27, something like that percent. So there's a significant higher level of the secularization in the American Jewish community. And I don't question any of these statistics, and of course one could go on lugubriously spending out more and more problems. But as a theologian, I have often, have often tried to focus in on the other side of the coin, not just the sociology, but what deeper values, what deeper, I'd like to think sometimes, what deeper divine movements and responses are reflected in what's going on, and because sometimes that helps us decide what to do. So in trying to come up, deal with this decline, I've become more and more convinced 
that decline is the wrong model. I think something new is being born, and I'll lay out my theses, and then we'll try to flesh them out and then get your responses. Thesis number one is that this shrinkage, that this lessening, is not just about religious institutions, it's about the presence of God in the world, but that this is the will and decision of God, so to speak, and should be accepted and welcomed. Presumably God knows, God only knows that God knows what God's doing, but anyway, <laughs> um, you'd like to think that a decision like that was well thought through and has a positive purpose. Secondly, I do believe we're living in a post-rabbinic age. But I'm not sure that's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. When you are entrenched, when you are the establishment, when you are in power, it leads to, for example, high status, which attracts opportunists and people who are much less interested in the substance but looking for either power or whatever. When you are in power and when you are the establishment and when you are given automatic authority, it leads to a lot of overreaching abuse, sometimes arrogance, sometimes ego. If you're not, if you're out of power, or if you are on the being replaced, you know, actually, usually that's the time when professions act nicely. They sort of, you don't feel the arrogance, you don't feel you're automatically right, so you try to think and really be right by working at it. You don't feel you have the automatic authority, so you sort of feel you have to earn that people will listen to you. Or you have to be really relevant and persuasive. And I think modesty in general is helpful in terms of striking the proper spiritual and personal leadership notes. So as I say again, it's not all bad to be uh, not in power or not as the dominant or automatic authority anymore. In fact, my proposal is simply this. If, as rabbis, and there are other people in the room as well, I'll come back to them, if one is prepared to rethink one's relationship, one is prepared to rethink our role, to try to understand what is possible for a rabbi in a post-rabbinic age, and I'm using that ambiguously because in the room tonight are people who are not rabbis, but who I am going to argue are in fact rabbis in the third period of the covenant, which I'm about to talk about. In other words, if you're willing to reimagine what the word rabbi itself means, and that includes so-called secular workers, people who go work on campus, there's nothing formally religious about the campus, or people who work in JCCs and so on, if you're willing to understand that that's also part of being a rabbi, or potentially being a rabbi in a post rabbinic age, the truth is I think we can expand our influence and really accomplish some very great things. So, so let me offer my thesis now in four steps. Step number one is my claim, or my argument, and this they are in the book, that the core of Judaism, there are many great things, there are many great themes in Judaism, there are obviously multiple ways it has been understood for 4,000 years, but I would argue that the core of the religion and the source of its major impact on world history it is the most influential religion of all time, the source of its, in part because it's influence on the most influential religions of all time, but it's okay, it's, it was the most influential religion of all time. Its impact on the world, I believe, grows out of its core message. And its core message is that Judaism at its heart is a covenant of what I would argue is legitimately called tikkun olam, with apology to all the people who think tikkun olam is of course a code word for the New York Times editorial page or for the Reform Rabbinate's um, official Torah. And it's not fair to reform either to say it that way, but that's the standard cliche out there. It is a religion of covenant of tikkun olam, and what do I mean by that? That Judaism's main teaching is that this universe we live in is not a random accident, meaningless physical process that came into being and will eventually go into oblivion. It is a creation. As a creation means it has order, it has m wondrous, magnificent beauty, symmetry, order, but it also has purpose and direction. Secondly, the reason it does is because it has a creator. That is, of course, the most widely recognized Jewish impact on world civilization, a universal, invisible, but nevertheless all-powerful, sustaining God, we call God, a caring, deeply involved divine being 
who has brought this world into existence, sustains it, and has planted in it a movement or a direction. And that direction is toward life, not only quantitatively, but toward quality of life. And this God wants it to end up in perfection. Now, I say a direction toward life. That happened long before humans arrived on the scene. It's more than a billion years since the first cell made its appearance. And since then, there has been an extraordinary explosion of life. To human knowledge, 10 million species and counting. That all has grown. So it's a universe that's moving toward life. It's nurtured by a God of life who wants life, who loves life, who blesses it, and keeps saying, Puravu, give me more, Meluat arts, fill the world with life. This fundamental development leads to a turning point because life develops not just quantitatively but qualitatively. Life becomes more and more like its hidden ground. As life grows, it becomes more and more capable, or to put it in the language of the Bible, it becomes more and more godlike. And the climax thus far, after a mere billion years, is human life. This form of life is so highly developed, it is called in the Bible the image of God. Let's say it has powers that are godlike. Mind, consciousness, God has an infinite, unlimited mind, the humans can grasp a little of that infinity. Humans can grasp the nature of the world. I used to think this is an exaggeration. So it dawned upon me one day, in my lifetime, two human beings named Watson and Crick deciphered DNA, that's the code of life. Now, they didn't invent it, but I would say it's no small accomplishment to have deciphered it. Not to mention that once you decipher it, you can make corrections. You can actually cure things that God, so to speak, messed up in the natural form. So the idea that human is godlike is not an exaggeration. It's a description that we're coming to understand more and more. And God wants this. Human beings have godlike qualities of love and relationship. God is tov la kol rachamav al kol masav. God is good and loves all creatures. Rachamav, God's mother love, rechem, is extended to all God's creatures. The human is the one form of creature that is capable of growing in love to the point you don't only love yourself. That's no trick, and that, we're all born with that capacity. But to grow in love so that you extend it to your, first to your mother's breast, and then to a mother, and then to a family, and then to friends, and then to society, then to the world, and then to trees, and you go hug a tree. I mean, that capacity to keep growing in love, that's godlike. Here's the flip side of that. That dignity of reaching this level of development is a turning point in cosmic history, according to Jewish tradition. Why? Because this divine creature, creator, who has already set this process in motion, responds to the development of human life, a godlike life, in a special way. And that way is to enter into covenant, to be prepared to connect to human beings, to say that together, I built a universe that's moving toward life, it's using toward quality of life. This life in itself deserves to be treated with the greatest of respect. In fact, the higher the form of life, the more respect you owe it. And the highest form of life, the human being in the image of God, according to the Talmud, Sanhedrin 37a, you look up the details because I'm, I'm throwing out stuff without explaining it fully. Every human being in the image of God is born with three fundamental dignities. That's the Jewish teaching. Infinite value, if you save one life, it's like saving a whole world. That means each individual is infinitely valuable. And that means, in turn, if you understood and treated a human being right, you would spend any amount of money to save their life for one day, maybe. You'd spend any amount of money to develop their minds because they're infinitely valuable. No one would go hungry for lack of food because they're infinitely valuable. There should be enough money and food for anybody. So number one is every human being is infinitely valuable. Every human being is equal. There is no preferred image of God. According to Judaism, that's idolatry. When you claim God looks like Zeus or God looks like Venus. All humans, all 
are images of God. There is no preferred image of God. It's not white, nor black, neither male, nor female. Not even Jewish, and that's a shock. <coughs> but now, <coughs> finally, <coughs> every human being has the dignity of, uni of uniqueness. An image of God is unique. It is irreplaceable and non-duplicatable. So here's my punchline. So Judaism predicts that this God loves creation, creation, loves creatures, wants this world to be perfect. And what's the definition of a perfect world? Jewish tradition, what's the definition of a perfect world? What's the answer? Number one, they serve a lot of food. No, number one is, number one is that it's full of life. This world, before we're done, will be full of life. Number two, especially life in its highest form, image of God, which is human. Number three, and the world will be structured to support, uphold, and respect those dignities. In other words, infinite value will be practice. That means nobody will be allowed to go hungry. That means poverty will be overcome because poverty robs people of the ability to develop and capacity and so on. It means you have to stop oppression, which is built on the theory that some people are superior to others. That means sexism is done because it denies the equality of whichever sex you're denying right now. It means that racism is done. It means anti-Semitism is done. So this covenant that God enters into is a covenant that says we will turn the world, which is not this way at all now. As I'm talking to you, millions of children are dying of hunger or of dysentery or diarrhea in Asia and Africa because their life is worth nothing or next to nothing, right? But that's wrong. And God has entered into a covenant. The covenant is self-limitation on both sides. The divine, infinite creature beyond human comprehension is prepared to self-reduce and to become available so humans can relate, can love, can connect, can listen, can learn from. It's a tremendous self-reduction to make God, make God available in a way that humans can begin to grasp. We can't grasp, but we can begin to grasp. And God is prepared to accept obligation to these people because God cares deeply and wants with these people together to perfect the world. That's why I call it Tikkun Olam. To bring a world into being that will be full of life, that will uphold life in all its dignities. That is the central core teaching and that's what human beings should spend their life. And Judaism predicts, that's the messianic dream of Judaism, that before we're done, this world will be turned into a Garden of Eden. That means everybody will have all the food, all the money, all the clothes, all the shelter, that there will be no more world. They'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Remember, you heard it here first, right? Before we're done, this is Isaiah's promise. Before we're done, the will cure sickness, because sickness robs people of dignity. Sickness robs people of uniqueness. Alzheimer robs of their memory. So Isaiah predicts, before we're done, we will cure. The, 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 the blind will see. You can look it up for yourself. It's in the 30s, right? The blind will see. The lame will leap and dance. The deaf will hear. And Isaiah's ultimate promise, of course, is our goal is nothing less than overcome death itself. It's a long way off, but that's the goal and that's the vision. Now, why am I telling you all this? Because I think the core of Judaism has been this impact on the world. This messianic vision was so powerful that it launched Christianity, which in the end spiritualized, partly because of the conflict between the real world and this messianic vision. So having insisted the Messiah is here, had to then spiritualize that but it, that's how powerful it is. It's not just 14 million Jews. It's a billion, nine hundred million people whose lives are shaped by this messianic vision. Well, how about Islam? Which also, only in the Shiite form, keeps the Messiah idea, but keeps the basic idea of a God, a God of justice, who will give you the perfect world, maybe mostly in the world to come, but it's the perfect world promise. Well, most important, modernity, the most dominant, dynamic, and powerful culture of all time still reaching billions of people and still growing, is fundamentally built on this vision. They don't accept the world as it is. It can and should be and will be transformed. In fact, you can make it perfect. What drives modernity is the thought that humans will take power and will take power and will overcome poverty and hunger and oppression and war and sickness 
And the death itself, there are serious people out there who are working on that project. So this has been world-shaping, civilization transforming, for good and for bad, because some of the people got carried away by this vision, decided the only way to achieve it is by killing a lot of people, including Jews. That's the world vision, that's our teaching, that has been, now here's what I want to bring tonight, however, that I think is a little different. Looking back, and I'm not the first one to say it, obviously, this covenant is a pedagogical covenant, meaning that God enters into it with humans, but like a loving parent or a great teacher, self-limits to the capacity of the student or the child. As a parent, you learn you have to curb your love, not to smother and drown the child. You learn to control yourself, and as the child matures, to control yourself even more so the child can grow and take adult capacity. That is the heart of the covenantal model. And looking back over these 4,000 years, Margaret's were in three, there have been three stages. We're living through the third stage, which will bring me to the rabbis and why it's a post-rabbinic age. First stage can be very simply described. It's the biblical phase. In the biblical phase, this is a partnership, okay? But you know, this one partner that's overwhelmingly dominant, runs the show, tells you what to believe. When I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. And of course, that's exactly what the Bible is like. In this biblical stage, the dominant partner is so dominant, they don't even bother using the term partner. But it's there. It's a partnership. The dominant partner, well, for example, when the Jews are in Egypt, they're overwhelmed. They're broken by slavery. They're feeling helpless. When Moses comes, they don't even listen. They don't believe anything can be done for them. When they're helpless, what is it? God sends a messenger. God sends a series of extraordinary miracles that break the back of the oppressor. God sends them into freedom, and then when the Egyptians chase them, God splits the Red Sea, God drowns the Egyptians, and the people understand God. They understand this partner intends to do. Now again, the covenant intends to perfect the world, but the Jews are the beginning. The whole world will be liberated someday, but the Jews are the first. The whole world will someday have a society built on justice, which respects the equality of people. Non-exploitation, which respects the dignity and value of people. But we'll start with the Jewish people. That's the model. The whole world will someday be holy from stem to stern. As, as Isaiah says, the whole world, when they do no evil, no injustice anywhere in the world, then the world will be full of knowledge of God. But the Jews started off. That's the first phase. And again, God is very serious about this, and in both ways, by the way. In this phase, if the Jews listen, they're in good shape. It rains. If they don't listen, it doesn't rain. They drought. For farmers, that's devastating. In this phase, if the Jews obey God, God sends a liberator and they are free. They disobey God, God sends an oppressor and they are oppressed and they are ground down. It's a remarkable um, a world experience and it is an expression of covenant in the biblical form. Nowhere have I mentioned the word rabbi up to now. And you know why? Because there are no rabbis in the biblical period. So what happened? My point is the rabbis come into being precisely because of the transformation and the pedagogy that's implicit in covenant. The turning point to Jewish history, which really brought the rabbis not into existence, they started before that, but into power, was of course the destruction of the Second Temple. And the problem of the Second Temple, you all understand. The problem is very simple. It shouldn't have happened. I don't mean it shouldn't have happened. Of course we don't want it to happen. I mean it shouldn't have happened by the covenantal principles of the Bible. Because if the Jews listen, God saves them. If the Jews obey, God will defeat the most mighty enemy. Well, the revolt against Rome was a revolt to clear the temple of that rotten emperor statue, of the idolatry that the Romans paraded, of the impurity that they inflicted on sacred precincts. It was a national revolt for independence so the Jews could be faithful to their God and their religion. Well, so by the rules of the, never you mind, this is the world's greatest power, by the rules of the biblical understanding of covenant, they should have been saved by God. Last minute, God should have split the Red Sea, split the Mediterranean Sea, and the Roman fleet should have run aground. God should have, I don't know, split Jerusalem in half, and the mountain should come crumbling down on the Roman army and crush the last one, and the Jews would live happily ever after. It didn't happen. How do you understand that? How do you explain that? Well, of course, the Romans had a very good explanation. Our gods are stronger than your gods. 
That's what the answer is. And we beat the gods of Egypt, we beat the gods of Assyria, we beat the gods of enemy, and we're beating your God now. End of story. Or I give you the Christian version. The Christian, as you recall, up to this point, are basically Jews, most of them. Well, they're spreading among non-Jews. The Christian understands the destruction of the temple very clearly. You see, God rejected you. It's true you're the original covenant. It's true. We accept that. We grew up in this place. But you know what? We thought, in fact, we're continuing. We're not continuing. God closed the temple and rejected Judaism, and that's the explanation of this defeat. The rabbi's answer, I think, was a far more profound, and of course it's the one that ended up being accepted and, and the basis of Jewish living. The rabbi's answer was, there was a transformation here. The same self-limitation that brought God into covenant, God did a second, as it were, encore, self-limitation, a major reduction a major reduction of God's presence, intervention in the world. Not that God has left the world. Keep this paradox in mind. The rabbis insist God made this reduction to come closer to you. Not to get further, not because God is abandoning you, but to get closer to you. But God has self-limited. And therefore that means the nature of divine intervention is drastically changed. And you know why God did this? Not just to get closer to you, but because God wants you to step up and take more responsibility. You've been a junior partner. You've been a passive partner. Up to now, who were the leaders of the Jewish people? It was the people who could connect you to that dominant, electrifying, overwhelming God. When God is that powerful and that dominant and that electrifying, you can't go to God everywhere. God fills the world. We all know that, but you don't go to God that way. You go to God. If you saw God directly, you drop dead. So what do we do? We go to a temple where God is shielded. We have a, a priest who stands between you and God and therefore takes all the lightning bolts and all the electricity in his body if he doesn't do the right job. He brings your sacrifice and you stand there passively and watch it. Or, alternatively, God wants to speak to you. God will send a direct messenger known as a prophet who will tell you this is the word of the Lord. Ko Amar Hashem. Period. But suddenly God has pulled back, said the rabbis, to come closer and to get you to be more active in the covenant. That's how rabbis came into being and into power. What's a rabbi in this point? The rabbi is the one who in a world where God is more hidden, less interventionist, can connect you to God and can tell you what God wants from you right now. And can help you therefore deal with your daily problems with that guidance. Now hear me out. So what does that mean concretely? The rabbi said God has self-limited. First I'll explain to you what happened with the Romans. It's God's policy to be more limited intervention. No more of these visible overwhelming miracles that reverse nature and overthrow major powers by a flick of the divine wrist. That means God will intervene in a limited, hidden, and restricted sort of way. So, if you intend to defeat the Roman Empire, you can't count on God to reverse all of nature. This was the second destruction is because you blew it, your leadership messed it up. First of all, the leadership should have asked themselves, should we go to war right now or should we wait this out? We're not going to win. The leadership should have said, is this responsible to provoke the Romans or should one in a moment, you know, take a, take a few until we get a chance to change it. Secondly, that leadership, the worst thing, they developed in the middle of this battle against the Romans, a civil war. If you intend to beat the world's leading power, do not start a civil war on the side. You're not going to win. So God did not intervene to reverse history. If you had played it right, you wouldn't have been in destruction. But that's the explanation of this restriction. But this restriction has amazing consequences. I'll give you the obvious ones. God is self-restricted. You know what? No more voices from heaven. That's over. In fact, famous rabbinic story, when the voice of heaven speaks and tries to tell the rabbis what to decide, they say they don't listen. It's not in heaven anymore. That's the point. God is self-limited. God is not sending any more prophetic messages. So how do I know what God wants from me? And how might I know there is a God? Because I don't see these kind of visible miracles anymore. That's what the rabbis did. So what's the rabbi's answer? We know what God wants from us. God has not left us. God has gotten closer. God is sending messages all the time, but you have to use your brain. God wants humans to use their brain to figure out 
what is God's message right now? I'll tell you what the rabbi does. He says, you know how we're going to know what God wants? We're going to go and study the original traditions we have where God spoke from heaven. We're going to study the Torah. We're going to study the prophets. That's the first hint to what God wants right now. Secondly, turns out when you study them, God's voice has multiple levels. There were whole levels we never saw. We weren't paying attention. Or we were so enthralled by the sound of heaven that we never stopped to ask, is there multiple layers in this? So it turns out many of these sentences have multiple layers. You thought it only said, don't cook a kid in its mother's milk. It really meant don't cook any meat in any milk. And so on. You can go through hundreds of lists. It has tremendous applications. Thirdly, you can apply it using your best judgment to this moment. For example, we believe God wants the world to get more justice, more equality. You know what? In the Torah, they said, put limits on how, who you can sell your daughter to. In the Torah, they already said some limits on how a husband can divorce his wife. Well, we're going to make the next step on this path toward a full equality. You know what? We're going to give her a marriage contract, a ketubah, that will give her extra rights in case of divorce. We're going to give her a marriage ketubah that will give her a guaranteed income or economic security under difficult circumstances. The Torah said treat the laborer. The Torah said restrict the slavery. Six years. During the six years, we're going to make a rule. You've got to give them better pay. You've got to give them better hours. You've got to give them better conditions. In fact, equal to the master. So the rabbi said, not only do we learn what God said to us then, but we apply it now and we move it on the covenantal path toward our final goal of a perfect world. That was the role of the rabbis, to study. Now, how about experiencing God? The rabbi said, this is an opportunity. You can't experience God the old way. You know, up to now, God has been broadcasting on AM. If you tune into AM, you're going to hear only static and say, oh, there's no God, there's no message anymore. So the trick is you've got to tune into FM. On FM, you will get the message loud and clear. So how do you tune into FM? Will you study the Torah? Up to now, it wasn't important for you to study Torah. Talmud Torah is not important in the biblical period. We're going to make it the central, because if you study and enrich your memory, you'll be able to hear God. You're able to hear God's message. You'll be able to go on a much deeper level spiritually. How are you going to hear AFM? We're going to help you. Another way, you're going to tune in and connect. I told you God became more hidden. God wants to come closer. God is now Shekhinah. Shekhinah, that's a term again. God as Shekhinah is not mentioned in the Bible. Just like partner is not mentioned. The rabbis mentioned God as a partner. In this self-limited God, Shekhinah, you want to meet God? You're not going to see it the old way with the lightning bolts. You know how you'll see it? Start the best clue. Go find an image of God, a human being in the image of God, and tune into them, and you will see God is right there. For example, chesed. Can we look at chesed and do a favor, for, do a good deed. For example, someone is sick. You go visit that person. You know what? Shekhinah is right there at the head of the bed. If you tune in to this person and their sickness and you share it, you will see Shekhinah right there. You know what? A man and a woman, husband and wife, are making love. If you do it right and you tune in to the image of God of this person, you respond to the uniqueness, to the value of this person that you're making love to. You know what? Zohu, you do it right. Shekhinah ben Am. Shekhinah is right there, said Rabbi. Just tune in. You'll see it. You'll experience it. Study Torah, Shekhinah is right there. Ten people study Torah, Shekhinah is right there. Five people study Torah. One person studies Torah. Shekhinah is right there. As you learn more, as you tune in, so the rabbis opened up a vast set of experiences where Shekhinah is right there, not as the God up there who frightens you, as the God who embraces you, who shares your life, who cries when you cry, who is part of your life. Furthermore, the rabbi said, this symptom which wants us to do more, if we do more, that means we have to take the holiness, the kedusha that was concentrated, high power in the temple. It was so high powered, you couldn't walk in there unless you went through purification rite. There were parts of the temple you couldn't walk into, period. There's a part of the temple where no one can go in but one person once a year. And he's got to go in with incense cover because otherwise he'd be dropped in dead. But now the kedusha is hidden but present everywhere. You can make a shul anywhere in the world. You can find 
the divine presence. You can expand Kedusha, everything. You know what? In the past, we had to bring a korban. We had to bring a sacrifice in the temple. The priest had to bring it for us. You had to go through purification rites. You know what? Now you can prepare an animal, slaughter it. Kosher. You can prepare the food. You'll make a bracha. You'll eat it at home. And there is your altar and there is your sacrifice. So the holiness is much more present, and you can do it, and you can bring it into your life every single day, almost every single moment. I'll give you another example. The good old days, God talked to us. It was great. Good to know. Although it's interesting to me, they never listened. I don't know. You'd think, you'd think if a voice from heaven would come, say, do it, I'd say, do it. Well, it didn't, it didn't work out. It didn't quite go that way. But you know what? If God won't speak to us, say, rabbis, you've got to go talk to God. And then you'll experience it. That's what prayer is about. As Salvechik says, the Jewish community moves from the prayer, from the prophetic community to the prayer community. Prayer is, I'm not going to accept silence or a break in the covenant or in the bond. I'm going to speak to God. I'll speak to God. Now, again, I'm not trying to make, uh, obviously part of it is speak to God. You'll ask God for favors, for needs. And when you get them, you'll feel, ah, oh, well, God's in my life. But it's more than that. It's also to praise God. It's also to become aware of God. It's also to look at life differently. If you really tune in, you'll see, you're not going to have the old miracles, no more visible miracles. There's a miracle every day. We say that in the Shemon Esra. Right? Nisecha shebechol yom imana. There's your miracles every single day. You know it's a miracle? It's a miracle when the first plant blooms in the spring. And you know there's a bracha for that. It's a miracle when you go to the bathroom and you move your bowels successfully. And if you'll tune into that, there's a great bracha for that. And the bracha says, God, I know you created human being. And you created tubes, openings, closings, holes. And I know that if one of those tubes should open at the wrong time, that's, of course, another way of saying a stroke, right? When it opens at the wrong time and the blood leaks into the brain. Or should close at the wrong time. That's what a heart attack is, when something blocks the blood flow. Right? I know I couldn't exist, so bless you, God. So you make miracles every day for me. So that was the incredible achievement of the rabbis. They really got people to understand there's an expansion of Kedusha. If you talk in halachic terms, tremendous expansion of observance. Every area of life has the potential to be suffused with this awareness of God's presence, to be brought closer to the level of perfection. And as a way of doing that systematically, that was the rabbi's contribution. Now again, you have to understand, it is a change nevertheless, because it's hidden miracles, no more visible miracles. And it's interesting, the rabbis say, what is the great holiday that you celebrate that reminds you of God's miracles? So in the biblical period, the great holiday that proves that Judaism is not an illusion, but a down payment, that the world will someday be redeemed, what's the proof of that holiday? It's Passover. The holiday when God did all those great miracles and smashed the Red Sea, etc., etc. You know what? What's the holiday that proves that the covenant is true and that it goes on in our time? What's the rabbi's answer? It's the holiday of Purim. And you know why Purim? Because Purim is hidden miracles. Because humans took the initiative. If, if Esther hadn't gone to if, if if Mordechai hadn't gone to Esther, there would have never been a miracle. And the whole book never mentions God's name because that's the point, say the rabbis. We're living in an era when God is much less visible, humans are much more responsible, but the covenant goes on. And because the rabbis grasped that, they actually turned what could have been a disaster, right? Cut off from God, loss of land, exile into a moment of tremendous flowering, spiritually, religiously, and every other way. In fact, that's the final point I want to make about the rabbis. They equipped the Jewish people to go through an incredible 2,000 years of exile and powerlessness. No other people survived such an experience. Normally, you lose your land, you lose your religion, you lose your God. On top of that, what people could stand for 2,000 years almost as pariahs, as outsiders, as hated. I mean, Christianity and Islam spread such ugly images of Jews, such horrifying images of Jews. They were treated as less than valuable. They were kicked out repeatedly. They were abused. Right? What happens to people who are treated that way? They usually crumble. They lose their spirit. They lose their self-respect. They collapse. Look what happened to 
African-American family life under the pressure of slavery? How come Jewish family life survived? This is the rabbi's accomplishment. It's what I call an ethic of powerlessness. They said, look, yes, we're powerless. Yes, we are by the standards of the world, we're nothing. But the core message, we are the most important people in the world. Number one, it's worth living this message because you're the most important people to God. So write off politics, write off military, that's for Gaia. Write off physical activity, that's for it. What you've got to do is, number one, is realize you have this cosmic spiritual role. Number two, more important, more important is that we are going to make life so rich, so fulfilling, so, com com so whole, that's worth living it. How do we do that? So the answer is, that's what Jewish life is all about. Family time, marriage, family experience, love, sexuality, Shabbat, joy, celebration, food, friendship, prayer, study, education. We'll make this life so rich and we'll make this life such a communal solidarity life. When you're in trouble, people will come and help you. When you're sick, people will come and help you. If you are kidnapped, they'll raise money all over the world and they'll come and they'll save you. That if you are poor, they will have a fund to look out for you. So they built an incredible internal life that said, yeah, maybe they spit on us, we're peddlers during the week, but you know, at least at Shabbat and really all week long, we know that we are really princes. We know our dignity, we know our value. We know this life is worth it. Yeah, it could be an easier life, a better life as a Christian, but this life is so rich, I'm willing to make the trade. Second thing accomplished was, of course, and bluntly, it's part of the story, we are morally and ethically and spiritually superior. Yeah, they can beat us up anytime they want, but they are inferior. The beating up is part of their inferiority. That's why I said they're going, you know. Spiritual moral, Jews don't hunt. Jews don't beat. Jews don't, you name it. That's our moral superiority over Gentiles. They spill innocent blood. We never, they have armies. We don't have armies. They have, they fight wars. We fight in Torah. Slightly exaggerated, and of course, possible when you're powerless, but that was part of the package. And the result was the rabbis created an ethic of powerlessness that brought the Jewish people through this period with dignity, value, and family intact. Which brings me to the final point. I'm sorry, I got a little carried away here. Let me get my act together here. About the third symptom. I believe in retrospect, of course that age is over too. And I believe personally that it, I've come to believe that it comes to an end again, not because of sociology and not because of history alone, but because of a divine cosmic rhythm movement that God goes through a third, if you will, symptom self-limitation. Unfortunately, this one wasn't picked up so quickly. In retrospect, I feel the Jews missed it, the religious people missed it, and the secular people missed it in their own way. Of course, I'm talking about modernity the last 400, 300, 400 years. The key message of modernity is human beings should take power if we take power, we can save ourselves. If we take power, we can achieve a perfect world. You don't have to accept the fact you're born poor, you're born a serf. You can change all that. We can make a world where you overcome poverty and hunger and oppression and inequality. We can make a world where you overcome war and sickness. We can overcome poverty industrially, economically. We can overcome hunger agriculturally. We can overcome sickness medically. So this is the messianic age possibility now, if we take power. Now I look back and say, I believe that humans were responding to this cosmic movement that was saying, I'm gonna self-limit, the time has come for you to step up to the next level. I believe that's what was happening. The tragedy was, in retrospect, that both sides missed it. The religious side missed it and therefore thought, what do you mean humans will do everything in so that means you're taking away from God's power. You're doing it, right? What do you mean we'll go back to the land of Israel? We've got to wait for the Messiah to do it for us. It's impious to try to go back to the land of Israel. And the secular people missed it, and a lot of secular people said, you know what, you're right, I don't see any God. I don't see God showing up anymore. If God is totally hidden, and that's my point of the third symptom, if God was partially hidden, now God is totally hidden. So the reaction of secular people is, there is no God. You don't see, you don't see the miracles. You don't see this. Don't. So we're God. 
And you know what? We're God. We can really be the God who will perfect the world. We can be the God who will overcome sickness and poverty and inequality. The tragedy of that being, of course, that when you think you're God and you start acting like God, the next thing you know is, well, I'm God, I own this earth, so I have a right to spend all the hydrocarbons that built up for five billion years in one generation, leaving pollution to my friend. If I'm God, I can pollute and global warm and wreck the whole place, because it's mine to do. I can do anything I feel like. None of the candles, anybody. If I'm God, then I'm God, then you know what? And then you get all kinds of movements to save the world and perfect it, really high speed right now, and the person who's the head of that is God. So you have the Fuhrer who promises to make the world perfect, only in order to do so, we gotta first kill off the Jews. Or you get Stalin, who promises to make the world perfect, but in order to get there faster, we gotta kill off the rich peasants, and we gotta have one police state, and we gotta crush everybody who stands in our way, or Mao Zedong. So the very revolutionary perfection of the world turns into totalitarian, destructive mass murder, because the people who run to think they're God and they have no one to account for but themselves and whatever they say is right. So it's a tragedy on both sides, but let me look at the positive side. What does it mean when God becomes totally hidden? What God is saying is, it seems to me, if we analyze this for a moment, I'm doing that to come closer to you. I'm using the rabbinic model all the way. I want to come real close to you now. And B, I want you to step up and take more responsibility. If God is totally hidden, I conclude God wants humans to take full responsibility for the covenant. The covenant is not changed. I'm still your partner. And people misunderstand this. I'm your partner in every sense of the word. I hold your hand. I give you advice. I judge you. I guide you. I love you. I support you. I criticize you. I do whatever is necessary. But I'm not going to do the dirty work, you're going to have to do it. And that's a total commitment. And you are fully responsible. Again, it's very painful to say that, because again, I would much prefer it the other way. But how do I apply that concretely? Well, again, I, first of all, I learned this lesson, I think, from Jewish history. The lesson you all understand, we all live through together. In retrospect, that's what the Holocaust is all about. Again, please do not take this as an explanation or as a defense of God. Because from my point of view, as a loving parent who felt the time had come for his kid to grow up and he no longer is going to step in to save him because he's got to now take full responsibility, I love that. But as my son said to me this week, but if I was a loving parent, even though I had made that decision and I don't intervene and I let my child, do it, including make their own mistakes, if I saw at that moment they're in the street and a car is bearing down at a top speed, about to crush them, I'd jump in and pull them back. So I can't answer and I haunts me to this day that God didn't do that. But I now understand if we accept the fact that God had made that decision of self-limit, that from now on humans must take full responsibility, then we understand what happened in the Holocaust very clearly. Starting from the Nazis, who took all power and who believed they could make the world perfect and all they had to do, to, the, main, the first step was to wipe out the last Jew, and who concentrated all the power and who felt that the God was their God, and their authority, and their state. I understand that. But it's not just the Nazis. How about the bystanders and human responsibility? Where the bystanders cared to oppose, in Denmark, 98% of the Jews were saved. In Bulgaria, 100,000 Bulgarian Jews were saved because they said they're Bulgarian citizens. You're not going to let them deport them to Auschwitz. It turned out that Bulgaria had an next Thrace from Greece. There were 25,000 Jews there. So them you can take. They're not Bulgarians. So they were killed in Auschwitz. So the bystanders made a huge difference if they wanted to, but they didn't. How about the Allies? The only ones who finally stopped Hitler, but before they stopped Hitler, could have stopped him by warning him, by letting Jews come as refugees, by bombing the rail lines to Auschwitz, by 50 different things they could have done and did not do because they didn't lift a finger. And world Jewry, and I'll go through all the dirty, or the whole list, how much did world Jews do? Did American Jews go to Washington on a march on Washington and then close down the White House until they did something? No, they did not. And one could go on and on. So I feel I'm only 
admitting the facts when I say we're living in an age where God is totally hidden and wants human to take full responsibility, not an abandonment, but because this is our chance to move the covenant forward. Now, what does that mean for a rabbi? That's why I say it's supposed to have been engaged because the function of the rabbi classically, this ethic of powerlessness, this ethic of connecting people to God's word that way, it seems to me is no longer the dominant channel anymore. If God is totally hidden, I will run the whole same routine that the rabbis ran. So how we know there's a God in this world? So what's the answer? I, again, I'm using the rabbi's motto. The answer, if God is totally hidden, you have to tune in even more deeply. It means God is even closer. So the Shekhinah, where are we going to find the Shekhinah? The answer is literally everywhere. In fact, you look in the secular, a place where up to, if God moved, if the holiness moved from the temple to the home, then in this age, the holiness moves from the home into the workplace, into the street, into the sports stadium, you name it. Everywhere where one can find the image of God and connect to it, you can find God. In your own life, there isn't an action. So my argument is, again, if we take the rabbi seriously, there's a tremendous expansion of Kedusha. So I, I give an example, of course, I'm, these are all guesses. I'll give one a simple example. One of the gems, if you will, one of the cores of halachic Judaism is this notion of sexuality as a religious activity. And the most dramatic statement of that is, of course, the rhythm of sexuality. You have a withdrawal from sexuality during the woman's menstrual period. You have a rebirth ritual in mikvah, and you resume sexuality. It's an attempt somehow to give either holiness or special whatever to sexuality. If you're living in an age when humans are fully responsible, when there's an expansion of holiness, then it seems to me the holiness is not just when you withdraw, but when you take power and you exercise, you practice sex. So then the holiness becomes, how can one be a good lover? I mean that seriously. How can I give more pleasure to my partner? How can I give more love to my spouse? How can I be sure that the physical statement is confirming a profound emotional connection and deepening it. So that in fact, it's not just a holy part where you're not having sex, you have a tremendous potential, and I really feel all sexuality should be judged that way. Pre, post, whatever. In other words, the very notion of sexuality itself, seen as potential kadusha, becomes does it express covenantal values? Does it express commitment? Does it express the value, the equality, the uniqueness of this person? Does it confirm their value? Or does it exploit them and make them feel cheaper? Does it deepen their sense of worth? Or does it make them feel besmirched? There's the potential for holiness. I go on and on. Kashrut, I believe, grows from reverence for life. But if we're living in the third era when God wants us to increase reverence for life, so you look at Kashrut, how does it express reverence for life now? Well, we know. Kashrut says you should be a vegetarian. That's what it says. But since we're living in a world which is not perfect, we'll let you eat meat with restrictions. That's basically Kashrut. The lower the form of life, the less the restrictions. The higher the form of life, the more restrictions. So the whole point is before you eat, don't just eat. When you eat, you should keep in mind that this eating, including killing other living things, should express respect for life. So if you kill it, kill it painlessly, shechita. If you limit your meat intake, I'm serious, if you limit your meat intake, that's a statement of reverence for life. So now what do you do in the third era? So my answer is number one, maybe you'll become a vegetarian. That was the messianic dream. Or restrict further the amount of meat, even kosher meat that you take. Secondly, we'll look at the meat. How is it prepared? Do we have to show reverence for life? Were the animals treated with reverence before they were killed? Or as we, as we saw in those horrifying videos, they were abused. And that's not kosher. That's not meeting the standard of reverence for life. Then how about echo kosher? In raising these animals, what do we do to the environment? What do we do? That's also part of the whole expansion of Kedusha. So it's not just eating the cow. It can be kosher with a bracha. It's preparing the cow, feeding the cow. It's the manure of the cow. I'm serious. It can pollute streams or it can become a source of fertilizer and of upgrading life. 
So one should be looking for a tremendous expansion of Kedusha, of holiness in the third era. And again, what do I do as a rabbi? My answer is the rabbis have built in advantages already. So how can one be a rabbi? And I'll finish up with it. I'm trying to give some examples of what I would think is implied. Of course, the most important example is the point where we're taking power in the third era to move the world closer to equality, to uniqueness, to overcome poverty, to overcome war. That's the most important message. So what's my role? My role is to participate on the one hand and to prevent abuses of power on the other because the more power you have, the more potential for abuse. So again, I'd like to think that the rabbis could play that role. One of the dangers I see in America is the rabbis don't have power, so they exercise ethic of powerlessness instead of ethic of power. It's a much less responsible form of ethics. I see sometimes rabbis' criticism of Israel reflecting that kind of ethic. I can be pure and you can't be, instead of missing the point that the challenge is how do you apply power in the real world and do it responsibly. But again, these are the challenges. So, so how can I be a rabbi in a post-rabbinic age? So my answer is number one, not to take this as a threat, as a rejection, as a, as a frustration, to see quite the contrary. If holiness is in the secular, that means every lay person is a potential rabbi. If I can raise the level of learning like the rabbis did in spades, then if every lay person can become a scholar and connect deeply, then they will be able to discover Shekhinah at a deeper level and they will discover the most hidden God. If I can equip them with religious experience, religious skill, if I can accept the fact that they are the rabbis, you know what I'll be? I'll be a rabbi's rabbi. And that's a tremendous opportunity and privilege. The more, the higher the level of the lay people, or again, if I can accept the fact that so-called secular professionals can be rabbis, they can connect Jews to God, or to tradition, or to the vision of tikkun olam, or to the covenant, then I welcome them. They're not my enemy, they're potential partners. And together we can create a community education system. Or together we can do, create religious experiences. So that's the opportunity. The prayers are the powerful. I have a medicine here inspiring me how to use it properly. I'm a doctor here inspiring me to get up in the morning and make a house call. Inspiring me to read this text, this MRI, more accurately. Inspiring me not to abuse my power and over-treat, over-medicate, over-prescribe. And a rabbi can work with every single person, with every lawyer, with every teacher, with every plumber, with every physicist in your neighborhood or in your community. How can we direct this for tikkun olam? How can we exercise power responsibly? I would argue that in an age where we're having major breakthroughs, but also because of those major breakthroughs, there are major breakthroughs in my lifetime and yours for women's dignity. I don't just mean the obvious, that the traditional rabbis should have been the first and certainly not dragging their feet as they are to give women the fuller equality, the fullest equality. That's already a contribution that some rabbis have made to move in that direction. But to go beyond that in, in terms of the whole upgrading of women's status in every sense of the word, in every direction, that can be a moment of religious inspiration. Prayers for new experiences of women, prayers for new opportunities, and that applies to everybody. So as I see it now, we're living in an age where there can be major breakthroughs and we can play that double role of pushing the breakthroughs, nurturing those who are breaking through, and at the same time, being the voice of conscience and limit, being the voice of covenant and says, don't run away, you're not God, you're accountable. You're not God, it's not your world, you're accountable. If we can play that role, I think this can turn out to be that one's greatest, greatest contribution comes in a post-age. After, after my age ended, I made my greatest contribution. Or let me put it the other way. It could be the beginning of an age in which the prophet dreamt this, Ameh Kulam Sadiqim, which the whole community is in this together. Or as the prophet dreamed, all your children will be prophets. Well, maybe all your children will be rabbis. And in that, well, what kind of job is that for a good Jewish boy? I know, but if all your children are rabbis or all your children are prophets, maybe the Jewish people can show the world the way to turn this opportunity into a blessing for humanity rather than a catastrophe. Thank you.
take some comments or questions or rebuttal. <laughs> Sorry? Yes. Um, how does the old or the previous age continue to inform and also not inform um, the current age? When, when, is, when does the claim to tradition become things like women? Thank you for asking that question. You got it? You heard the question on this side? No. No. The question is, what's the role of the previous age in this age? And what does tradition still have to offer or participate in this age? And how do you make it into a blessing or, or how do you make it into a negative? How do we deal with that? So again, I'd like to use the rabbi's model for us. Really, it's brilliant. It's a good question. Another way, we are not repeat the Christian mistake. The Christian say, I got a covenant. I really believe they did get a covenant from God. It was God's will. In fact, as I argued this afternoon, when God was, felt the Jewish people was ready to move to stage two of a higher level after 2,000 years of training, God decided to open covenant stage one to the rest of the world, and that's what Christianity is born at the same time. The mistake they made is they said, well, I got a covenant from God. That means you don't have one anymore. <laughs> Obviously, if I got it, you can't have it. So the first thing is I'm not offering a new stage of the covenant to replace the old stage and throw it away. Just the opposite. The genius of the rabbis, they said, you can bring everything of the past with you. Don't throw anything away. Even if you won't practice it, even if you don't believe in it anymore, you can learn from it. Classic rabbinic statement, rebellious child. And the Torah it says the kid is a troublemaker, he rejects his parents, he drinks, whatever, kill him. That's one way of getting discipline back in this rotten American teenage group. But it, of course, the rabbi said, never happened, never will happen. No one's going to enforce that law. But they didn't throw it away. They didn't say this is a chauvinist residue from the ancient dark ages and went to hell with it. What they said is you can learn from this. Maybe it's a judgment about whatever. And so on down the line. So it's not that you're going to practice everyone. The rabbis didn't say, well, it says in the Torah, put him to death for this, put him to death for this. The rabbis say, you know, we're moving to a new level of human dignity. The truth is that death penalty upholds the dignity of life, but done, it also weakens respect for life. So the rabbis went ahead and they, as it were, moved the covenantal ball, or cheese, whatever, further by saying, we're going to restrict death penalty, restrict it, restrict it, it got to the point where once in 70 years, the whole... So I think those are models for us. Far from rejecting or throwing the rabbinic age out, I think, by well, speaking as an Orthodox Jew, I don't believe there's a single practice in the Torah that isn't potentially usable and livable. One of the huge mistakes liberals made was to say, it doesn't make sense, so just throw it out. And I think, of course, in the second round, liberals learned their mistake, and they're now willing to go back and say, no, he'll throw it out. Let me see if I can live it. And I can live it in a way that I can respect, that I can trust, that I can feel meets my moral standards, but it's available as a resource. So my answer is everything rabbinic is available as a resource, including the mistakes, including the things I don't agree with, and including how you go about perfecting the world one step at a time. Sometimes you make a bigger jump and you kill yourself, or you, or you kill the people in the standing in your way, or both. So I think we have a lot to learn by bringing it with us. On the other hand, and as bluntly as possible, we're responsible now. I find in Talba, as an Orthodox Jew, particularly it's upsetting to me. Right? So I don't have the authority to correct this. The problem with Aguna, it's going on now, 100 years, it got much worse because in modern times people can move, they can abandon their wives, they can join, leave the community. So the answer is, I, I can't help you because I don't have authority. What do you mean I have authority? You're in charge. That's what it means to be in the part of the covenant. The Talmud says, Jephthah, he's a, he's a wild outlaw, Grub Young, we just call him Yiddish. He's, he's an outlaw. He's a tough physical specimen. He doesn't, but they, they needed him to lead the people in war against someone. He became the leader. So the Talmud says, Jephthah in his generation has the same authority as Samuel, this priest of God, this high prophet, a scholar, and a saint, because he's in charge of that generation. You can't tell me I'm not in charge. So that's my point. So the rabbis of the day, 
And if they won't do it, then everybody else should step up, and that's exactly my point. And, then, and if the Orthodox won't do it, then the Liberals should step up and do it. At the same time, the Liberals, of course, have to remind themselves the same, not to make the same mistake from the other side. I just drop it, because I'm a 21st century chauvinist. Anything that brought it for 20th century is not up to date. Or, you know, the kind of the ways in which modern people say, well, that's pre-modern, so I don't take it seriously. Or, I don't believe you can live it. But, well, check it out before you make that decision. And well, at the same time, again, I respect this. Or, I would stress this, thirdly, I'll come back in one of the questions, maybe. The responsibility is broadened than just rabbis, and I believe there is responsibility, and if you take responsibility, even if you change the system, I think you can stand before God and say, I did what I, my best judgment was for you, and I think it'll be better this way. And maybe you're right. Maybe God will say you're wrong. Maybe it'll turn out you're wrong. Maybe it'll turn out you're right. Yo, sorry. I, there was someone next to him. I'll, I'll move around. This. I'll make a shorter answer. Go ahead. Right. They started before. They started before, but they have come to power after they resolved the problem of the community. Right. So then, when you're in the third era, which we're in now, it's like the rabbis are uh, in the second era, but he's hanging around in the third era too. So it's almost like he's got a foot in the first era, but he's really a second era figure, and he's also got a foot in the third era. And so, so you're arguing the rabbi should just disappear, basically, you're saying? It may be. It may be. A, you know, it may be. But I'm guessing no. First of all, because to me, one of the important things about rabbi was it's the shift. Rabbi comes in because up to now, who picked the leadership? The answer is God picked your leadership, whether it be the form of the prophet who is picked by God, not by the people. Number two, or by a priest who's also picked by God. Why? Because a genetic elite is picked by God. God is the one who decides that they're born a priest. God is the one who decides they're born first and they're the head. So the shift to rabbi reflects what I believe is the whole pattern of the covenant, that people take more responsibility, and now leadership gets to be leadership not just because they're chosen by God or because they're born to it, which is another way of saying chosen by God, but they earn it by his study, by becoming the connecting link to God. So my guess is, in the third era, no one has said you're not a leader, you're nothing. No one has said you're the lead automatically. You earn leadership. How do you earn it? By doing the exact same thing. It seems to be connecting people to God, to ultimate meaning, connecting people to the purpose of the covenant, connecting people to vital living, to showing how to live toward a perfect world, etc. So I'm guessing the rabbis shouldn't go home and say, I'm, I'm finished. What they should say, I think, is I'd like to participate in this process. If they do, they will be rabbis, they'll be influential. There are rabbis influential now in a post rabbinic cage. But if they hang around and say, how come I'm not getting automatic authority because I'm a rabbi? Or how come you can't do that because I'm an official rabbi and I say I don't have the power to do it? So my answer is, you know, you, people just ignore you and go on and do it. And they're the ones who are right and they're the ones who are responsible. Yes, sir. In the back and then we'll get to you. Person in the back, yeah. It's my friend and my teacher. I say this with trembling. Surely you know, I hope you would know, that there is a perceived meltdown in the non-Orthodox rabbinate. That many rabbis are in danger of losing their jobs, that our institutions are in financial trouble, that rabbis are living th through a particular time of gross vulnerability. I suspect that no one here wants to dismantle that task any further or make it more peripheral to the life of the Jewish people. Might I ask you for a word of nechemta? <laughs> okay. Not for me personally, thank God. No, well, Jeff, first of all, is really a longtime friend, and I have learned from him, and I have certainly enjoyed the fruits of his work, so I, the least I do is owe you in the response to that. Well, I, well, I think I've tried to give nechemta here. No, for, I'm saying a lot of that shrinkage and difficulty reflects not only particular sociological trends, which we can then blame on bad leadership or poor utilization. Part of it is based on really cosmic and global changes. 
that are not so easily reversible. Having said that, I've said, I think, the other point. I think rabbis, instead of sitting in the shrinking ship and complain and be threatened, should, you know, go for broke the other way. Easier said than done, and I'm glad you reminded me that it's easy for me because I haven't been the rabbi for 40 years now. Even though I think of myself as a rabbi, I, you know, I haven't had to meet a budget, and I, I, I haven't had to deal with late people who don't show respect and so on. So, so Jeff is giving an important reality check that my sweeping visions should be tempered by reality. Having said that, I really feel just that, that rabbis who are willing to do this, who move from the synagogue into the home, into the law office, into the will get a lot of financial support. I believe rabbis who are willing to, to become role models and inspire the people that you'll live deeper and richer this way, will get more membership and more institutional power, etc. So again, I also say the rabbis should not see this as a straight competition. They should make coalitions and friendship because if the whole Jewish community is more effective, then the synagogue will be more effective. But in saying that, I think everything I said tonight was an invitation for rabbis, far from, you know, putting the tail between their legs and slinking off into the night, the opposite, to say, I see this, I see this more clearly, I'm equipped, you, any Jew who wants to really take up the covenant will be challenged and enriched and inspired to know 4,000 years, so if I'm a rabbi, one of the things I can do, and I have to work on it, of course, is to know those 4,000 years and to bring those resources and those riches to them, and so on. In other words, as a rabbi, one of the most important contributions you can make is a role model. I mean that seriously. In other words, role model including how I model my relationship to my family and children. So, for example, again, at the rabbi, people should know the rabbi is not available seven days a week, 24 hours a day. But the rabbi has to have time and should have time to, have, to relate to her, his wife or her husband or to the children because you need that information for you to function as a CEO or whatever your big shot reason is for being the president of the show. So uh, my point only is that I, I, uh, the nechamt I'm offering is that I think instead of retreating that we should be stepping up and I think there's a tremendous receptivity. And the truth is even now, Rabbis who are more able to make these connections do better, and there are many flourishing synagogues. There are many struggling. And I don't, again, it's a lot easier. So I look back at Klau, I always, I have to acknowledge that it's, when you're with the stream, it's a hundred times easier. I recognize that. I look back at Klau, we had two main ideas in Klau. One was that lay people should learn. By the way, that again, it's not rabbis should do. I mean, that seems to me one of the most important points. Rabbis should see that they're not just for the synagogue, that they're for the federation, they're for the... The other main message was, we learn together, in fact. And again, I think rabbis should become a model of that instead of saying, no, I want you on my turf or my denomination. They said, learn together, you learn more that way. And people are excited when they have multiple rabbis with multiple viewpoints. But the other main message was Jewish unity, we have to have dialogue, we have to have mutual respect. So on item number one, it was a smashing success because it was... It was the trend. The American Jewry was moving toward, they want to be more Jewish. They recognize if they want to survive, they're going to have to be. So that was great. On the unity issue, we, you know, I got my head handed to me. I mean, we took a licking and shellacking on every, on every level, on every level. The nominational level, where a lot of people felt this is a, this is a you're subversive, you're undermining the denominations. On the, on the uh, communal level and the Orthodox community, what pluralism was, you know, they thought I was like, I was, I was pushing for dope, you know, cocaine. I mean, it's trying to sell pluralism. You take the stuff, it poisons you to death. You know, so it was, so what I, my point is only, I look back, before I start taking credit for Klaus Achim, I said to myself, let's face it, Greenberg, you were at least as committed to this as to this. Hey, you were total failure, you had total success. So what's the answer? The answer wasn't you. It's the community. It's the time, it's the willingness. So again, I don't want to say it's not harder to be a rabbi today, it is harder. But I think the opposite is true too, that going against the trend, you still can have huge successes as well as going with the trend, but you have to focus, you have to try harder, you have to get your friends together with you, you have to get every rabbi and every possible ally, every lay possible ally. And that's the other secret of Cla I'd like to share with rabbis. I, I was, I gave my, I was 24 hours a day, six days a week, but it was 24 hours a day. I mean, I was a workaholic. Clown never got anywhere until a group of serious laymen got involved. 
and really took charge and responsibility. Now, they didn't take it away, it didn't become useless. But the truth is, it just transformed the capacity and it didn't accomplish much as I wanted to do because I didn't succeed even bringing more lay people with more responsibility and more willingness to do things. So if I look back now, that was one of my key misjudgments, which I would like to correct and I try in the future correct and I would urge Robert to correct. You can get your allies, you can get, if you influence, become a rabbi's rabbi. If you can get them to be rabbis, if you can educate them, if you can inspire them, if you can get them to do the work, they'll work twice as hard and you'll get twice as much for the same amount of energy. Yes, you've been very patient, thank you. Um, yes, I wanted to just ask about prayer. I know you mentioned stage one, God speaking to us, stage two, us speaking to God. So now in stage three, clearly prayer can be a part of the holiness that you bring, but just in your own theological view, um, you know, is prayer something that is um, heard and responded to in, in terms of those stages? I mean, the it's other... A, you're, you're zeroing in on so many important issues and questions. That obviously, I have no definitive answer, but I'll tell you some of my first thoughts about it. First of all, again, my answer is, if you repeat the prayers the exact same way they've been up to now, they're not going to work for the most part, because they're at FM. Now, it's, that you can't hear FM anymore. But God is now broadcasting on VOIP, on voice over internet protocols. So if you tune in FM, what happens is it's harder to hear. You get a lot of static. So not you can't hear. If you work extra hard, and you do, that's what the rabbis did. They worked so hard that they could recover the prophetic voice. They could hear it and make it come alive again. So you can work hard, but you have to work a lot harder with the standard prayers inherited, number one, just for the same result. So maybe the working harder is turn it into music, Maybe working harder is concentrate better, meditate beforehand, maybe concentrating harder means, you know, you tell me, train, explore before you start to pray. Maybe it means creating opportunities to pray at the sunrise or at the Niagara Falls or something that really makes you feel the presence of God. That's, so that's one thing. You have to work harder for the same result. Number two, I, it's very painful to say, but I'll say it straight. It means, in my mind, in the third era, you're not going to get those kinds of miracles anymore. So a lot of prayers are really the prayers of the helpless who want a miracle. I think the answer is, you don't get anyone. I'm sure the rabbis felt the same way when they looked back and said, gee, not going to split the Red Sea anymore for me? Not going to do the kind of miracle that the, all the people will see and they fall on their face, like with Elijah, and they all say, Hashem, well, like him. I, I, I'm sure they missed that. Right? So they ended up creating a ritual on Yom Kippur where people at the end shout Hashem Ulochim. Now it's, you do the next best thing, but I'm sure they felt deprived by comparison. But I'm saying, I, I think mentally, I, I, I'm going to speak very honestly about this. First of all, I, I lived through this in the Holocaust. I kept, as I say, I kept saying to myself, and believe me, these are people, there are millions among them. By my traditional standards, saints and, and religious geniuses and virtuosos, and they prayed their heart out. It didn't help. I take that as a message, not that God doesn't care or that God doesn't exist, but it's a message. The message is, get the proper people, my partners. I told them to help you, I'll help them help you, but you've got to get them to help you. So that didn't help. Now I'll give you personal experience again. You know, again, it's funny, because again, I, I, it's 10 years ago, I wasn't to where I am now in this thinking, but I was there pretty far there. When we got the call from Israel that our son was hit by a car and his life is in jeopardy and uh, they think they, at that time, they still thought they could save things. What did I do? I jumped up and I ran to shul, not only to make a mishaberach, but to change his name. That's classic second era theology. And I guess maybe the answer is there's no atheist in the foxholes. Now, it didn't happen, of course. And after I look back and realize it, in part because I, should, I knew that. I knew that before I went there, but I didn't know that because, again, emotionally you regress to your childhood. You sort of wanted that miracle. I wanted the miracle. Yes, and it's heartbreaking. But I realized the real message there, of course, is those kinds of miracles don't get done anymore. So if I want that miracle, what I have to do, I have to, 
If not, I won't do it. It's not mine anymore. I've got to get doctors or others to do further research. They can now save people whose brain were damaged in an accident. They've developed ways they freeze them and they, they stop the blood expansion and the flow. And so people who were lost five years ago now can be saved. I don't know if that were enough to save my son. That's not the point. My point only is, if you want miracles, you have to do what God expects you to do to get miracles. And that's why, again, so to me, the work of science or the work of whatever is is sacred. Again, part of that sacredness is I've got to teach the scientists, and if I'm a serious rabbi, I will not only affirm them, I'll teach them not to abuse, not to turn this power into an abusive power, not an exaggerated power. But yes, my, my answer is, so I've got to work to make sure that cars now have requirements that they didn't have that save lives now. The third era, they seatbelt is a halach of the third era. No one should ever drive a car. No, I'm not, I will not drive my car. I tell people, buckle up. I will not start the car until you buckle up. Why? Because the main calling, the main purpose of this thing is life. Then something that saves life is a mitzvah, overriding mitzvah. So part of my job as a rabbi is to encourage the society to invest in medical research or to require cars. Now they have... Mirror in the back, so you won't hit somebody without seeing them in the back. Now they, or they have a, a vision of the camera in the back, so they got to require in the next car. There'll be a car someday where the car, when it begins to approach to hit somebody, it will trigger off the brake. I already have cars like this on that way, and that would have saved my son. So again, I, I have no answer right now. And of course, the loss is not going to be overcome anyway. But the reality is, if you take this seriously, so. All the prayers of that type, in my judgment, are of extremely limited value, and at the least, they should be less. In fact, I'll make that more sweepingly. The prayers of helplessness should be reduced. There are way too many of them, in the, particularly in the Orthodox tradition, because again, they kept adding, and they meant well. You know, there's a famous yeshiva joke, you know, these two yeshiva boys are studying in Jerusalem, and the, it's shelling during the Sixth Day, or whatever war it is, right? And they're sitting in the base of learning, and of course, you know, theoretically, Torah protects you. So they're sitting there learning, and suddenly a shell comes zooming over and blows off the roof. They look at each other, they keep learning. You know, then they hear another shell coming, it blows off the fourth floor. <laughs> they keep learning. Blows off the third floor. Blows off the second floor. Then they hear a sign of a whining shell coming again. He looks at the other and says, we can't just stand here. Let's say to him. <laughs> <laughs> no, so my point is, again, that, uh, I understand that, but that doesn't work anymore. So that's not a prayer we should be saying. What prayer should we be saying? Well, the answer is, I say there are three kinds of prayers. One is the prayers that, which are in the Siddur of the glory of God or the magnificence of nature, things like that. And I'm leaving out the other ones that it, because when you're trying to get God to do this miracle, you've little obsequious, that part I can do without. God can do without. But the parts that appreciate the magnificence of the universe I'm a part of, the inspiration and the personal love of God gives me those tefillos, I would certainly continue and I'll work harder at deepening. Then I want to write a whole bunch of additional prayers. Now prayer is finished. For example, again, I say, how about the prayers of the powerful? The powerful need the prayers. Maybe they need them more than the helpless because to use it properly, to not become, to do no evil, to do no harm, takes a major effort. So again, I, 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 I see a role for prayer. Not least of it, the prayer which is, of course, meditation, that locates me in the universe. So I know that that's one of the things, of course, it came to grips with my son. That's the book of Job is about. That Job had to realize, he didn't know answer why his children were gone, why he was wiped out. But his answer was, it's a vast universe. And God has made a universe of natural law and of order. And in this natural order and law, the truth is, if a teenage kid runs a light and your son is on a, is on a bike and he's very vulnerable and he's hit hard enough, he will be killed. That's the reality. Again, as I said, you want to change that reality, then the way you have to change it is improve the lighting system, improving the, the, you know, the, the car system, improve whatever. Those are the kinds of things that you should do to make this world more friendly for life. And that's a responsibility I feel very strongly for. But part of that is therefore, in, I tell people when they come to me with crisis cancer, I say, the first thing you do, the first thing you do, the first thing God wants you to do, is you get a good doctor. Number two, get a second opinion. And number three, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not dismissing prayers totally because I have found myself, paradoxically, when you pray for somebody who's sick, sometimes it helps them and sometimes it helps you, but it's not totally useless. 
But I do want to reduce that because I think it's really playing off weakness and that's not where God wants us to be playing right now. The prayers are the powerful, let's write them together. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, what will be your uh, suggestion for this third period for the seminaries? What should be now the curriculum that you will suggest to our distinguished seminaries? <laughs> okay, well again, I, this is all good questions. My answer is, I, well, let's, let's work on it together. Meaning what? You know, it's funny, I, I remember when I was in my younger days and was trying to get YU to, to improve its treatment. I was on the faculty of YU, but I was trying to work with some people to get the yeshiva to do a better job too. And of course, one of the things you do is you then, we went, we, we studied and talked to people at seminary and at HSC, what can you learn from them? We thought to upgrade YU. What struck me about this was that everybody we talked to was bitterly complaining, so you think it's bad now. They felt the same way then. And, it's, and I felt, and all three had the same problem, which is that they were sort of hung up on what they had been teaching all along, and they weren't ready to consider alternatives. So, so I just want to give you the consolation or the depression of thought that they're not likely to change even if I have a good idea, <laughs> because they're very strongly entrenched and, and slow to change. That having been said, it's obvious to me what we're talking about. We're talking about a curriculum that would include not just the capacity, really in all these areas, to understand, study holiness, which is to say intensification of life, and how you deepen it. That part of training a rabbi is offer a kind of, not a conventional, but a deeper religious experience. That part of training a rabbi is to get them to understand how the whole tradition, or as much of it as you can, can be a resource, and not just because you're building up facts or information, but how it can be a resource for living, which is what I think it's all about. I mean, again, one of the central verses of the Torah, it says, these are the commandments, asher yase otam hadam v'chai bahem, that the person should do these laws and live by them. I think that's very clear. Maimonides says the people who said you shouldn't violate Shabbat to save a life, he said they're turning the Torah into... Yechezkel, Ezekiel's curse. I gave them laws that a person shall not live by them. So again, you want the seminary to help not only teach you the laws of the tradition, but how those laws are laws of life, and frankly, where they become laws of death or laws of oppression. They should have the courage to, to teach me that and to deal with that. So I, again, I, what I'd like to see, I, I have all kinds of thoughts, I think, Theology or philosophy can play an important role. I think Bible and Bible th um, insights can play an important role, more so than they do right now. I think uh, it's wisdom of the world, what Islam Santa calls wisdom of the world. It's not just teaching rabbis about the tradition. It's also about the world we're going to live in and how it can be a resource. The tradition can be a resource or the religion can be a resource for improving that world. I, so again, I. I'm sure if we sat down to concrete details, we could negotiate this and work it out. But I, it, it will take, I think rabbis have come from the field and say, this is what I used. One of the sad things about Orthodox training, you spend a tremendous amount of time, let's say on Shulchan Aruch or things like that, that for the rest of my life, you know, if I got a couple of questions a week, I was sort of happy. And things that I dealt with every day, you know, how you deal with people, people in crisis, pastoral psychology, I got very little of. So again, there's no question in my mind that the seminaries should be. That would be a tremendous role. Should be to help us leaders in exploring all these issues and how you come up with religious guidance, religious answers, and how you can give me training that really equips me to equip others. Um, now, whether they would take such advice if we gave it is another question too. But again, you know, so honestly, it's a free country. I, I feel the answer is in part, they're gonna have to respond. Because if not, see, people aren't sitting around and waiting. People are, that's for, well, so tell us we all have to learn. It's also hard to be rabbi that way. In the old days, they were sitting around waiting, because they were to go. Now they can go. Not only can they, not only can they go to the rest of life, they can go to alternate rabbis, they can go to alternate and again, sometimes it's very cheapening and very unfortunate, right? I mean, Lubavitch will give you a free bar mitzvah, so now the, really, so the, so the result is that 
people who joined the synagogue for five years to have a bar mitzvah don't do it anymore. So Jewish education is cut even more than it already has been. So there are some sad things in a free society that come out of free competition sometimes cheapens the market. I understand that. Nevertheless, my answer is, I think in the long run, I, this is, may I finish with that, covenant itself is based on one fundamental decision by God. And that is that in the end, I want humans to do the right thing and to improve my world and to relate to me out of freedom, not out of being intimidated, not out of being ordered, not out of being whatever, right? Not out of being awed. So again, I do it in steps, but the goal was exactly, I think, where we are right now, that people are going to do it not because they are, not because they command it, but because they really feel this profound relationship to God. They feel this profound excitement of a chance to make a better world. They feel this connection to human beings, the image of God. They've been trained to think that way. They've been trained to think of the covenantal idea that we're continuing a chain of 4,000 years and that we can redeem and push further the work of all those people and the sacrifice of all those people. So I think that's where we are right now. And it, if we take it that way, both the seminaries and the individuals, if we take it that way, this could be a beginning of a rebirth of Judaism. Yeah, a thousand years now, what will they call it? They were calling rabbinic Judaism, but they didn't see it at the time. So if, we, if you're there first, and if you're willing to take the risks of the unknown and the risky and the bad judgments and the mistakes, and I made my share and more, if you're willing to do that, I think you really can be an Ebed Hashem and a servant, a leader, like Moshe. Ebed Hashem means you really have made this tremendous commitment, sacrifice, and contribution, both to God and to your fellow human beings, to the fellow world. And uh, that's a privilege, and it's worth spending a lifetime doing it. Okay. Thank you.